first of all, congratulations on this new, new album. It is fantastic. It is a very clean, powerful, impactful sound. Uh, you, you guys have been doing this for for since 1979. How do you guys keep up this energy? Keep up this high quality sound. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the um, you know, we one of our few bands, I think, you know. I suppose a lot of bands think that, but I just think we get better, you know, like and we started um, Heathen Cross off with the definite um, sort of criteria what, what we wanted to do, because um, I keep going back to all my favourite albums when that inspired me to kind of uh, become a musician in the first place. I, I kept going back to, you know, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath and Jailbreak, Thin Lizzy and uh, Deep Purple Machine Head and all that kind of stuff. And I was thinking, well, what was the magic really and it was a real they were real bands playing real music without mm -hmm. any sort of studio trickery at all and i was thinking well most albums get made like that these days uh, you know using you know, pro tools and all that stuff mm -hmm. i was thinking why why can't we go back to the old days of recording like a proper band you know like yeah. uh, all to get in the studio to try and capture that live en energy so instead of you just playing songs you really trying to capture a performance like the life the power of the band sort of live but in the studio and that's not going to abandon um the sound you know for the making the production good you know like we wanted that of course but we wanted to capture the, the life power of the band really so um i sort of um made sure that the songs are, are, are kind of stripped back because sometimes it's um, it sounds even heavier if you leave some things out to, to you know to leave uh, space for the instruments to breathe and everything and um, we had a fantastic producer, and his name's Patrick Engel, and he's kind of a sort of a genius. He's uh, from uh, Germany, and um, we talked talked about it for quite a while. You know, I wanted to capture that sort of um, that sort of energy live in the studio. So he gave us a list of uh, EQs for the drums and the bass and the guitar. So we we sound great right right from the word go. You know, like so. Uh, yeah, it was like making the albums in the old days, and. Uh, and Heathen Cross kind of, it's nice when something turns out just like what you, what, what you expect, you know, like, and it was uh, really close. In fact, I think it exceeded expectations, you know, like, because it's, you know, the, it's right in your face and the guitars like, you know, sound like they're in the room with you kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm real proud of this one. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you call it the darkest album to date. Uh, what, what makes this so dark? Uh, it, it has very powerful uh, power ballads and incredible solos but w w what makes this album so dark to you yeah it's kind of like re revisited uh, like the first album like with the um sort of occult themes because you know like we, we've made quite a quite a few songs uh about sort of uh, science fiction you know sort of based in the kind of future and stuff but i wanted to go back to the uh to our roots really and with a name like cloven hoof you know like i wanted to uh re-establish kind of our occult sort of um leanings and you know there's there's kind of a magic magic to this album as well um there's a song called sabbath stones on there and i had that riff it could have been on the first album you know like that that, that song i've had it for such a long time but i could never never do it justice you know i never found the right storyline and the right kind of melody for it and uh, it's amazing after all these years you know it was there and i've, I've always thought this will make a great song but i'll but um it's sort of left on the shelf there you know and i really wanted everybody to hear it but i had a nightmare i had a nightmare sort of um sort of last year kind of thing and i dreamt we were making the album uh in cornwall and i used to live in cornwall and i had a girlfriend down there and stuff and um the uh i don't i don't know what what brought it up but uh i had this weird nightmare and i heard the sabbath stone you know the sabbath stone guitar riff and i heard sabbath stones in there so that was a start, you know, I was thinking, that's amazing. And I told the uh, guitarist, Chris Cost, the next day, I went, I've had this nightmare. And I've actually, I could hear the, the song playing in my nightmare. And it said Sabbath Stones. And he said, well, you're going to have to write something with Sabbath Stones in it then, aren't you? And um, amazingly enough, this is crazy. But how I took all those years to think of this, um, my girlfriend from, from uh, Cornwall, she, she was from a place called St. Cullum. And, it had it had this church and a village green, uh, and you could see it used to have standing these old you know sort of um, uh, standing stones, you know, like uh, like druid kind of standing stones. 
And uh, and I went, um, that's a shame, you know, it's a shame, shame the, the stones aren't still here. And she says, they are. But the vicar didn't like the legend. I went, you know, what legend? You know, like she said, well, um, he had he had the, all the standing stones. Uh, oh, I've got the cover there, look, give you an idea. He had all, all of the standing stones, but the vicar had them taken away because of this legend that uh, it, it sort of told of seven sisters that were dancing on the Sabbath, Sabbath day and God turned them to stone because he didn't want it, you know, it's supposed to be a day of rest. And he removed the stones and he, and he it was outside the church wall. So they were there. And I went, what a cool legend. Why it took me so long to write that song, I'll never know. Because it, right away, I thought of that, that thing and that was it then. You know, like I, you know, the track right away started forming in my head, you know. And the Seven Sisters, I used that actual sort of lyric like in the song. So it's amazing the way the sort of the mind is. Um, maybe maybe in your sleep, my mind was secretly working on songs, you know, like maybe, I don't know. But um, it's it's um, it's amazing, really, you know, like how it, how it came together. So there's a little bit of magic in there right away, you know. So um, what I did as well, there's a song there called um, Curse of the Gypsy, and it's about a witch finder. So I, I came up with this sort of story. Instead of, instead of um, you know, he's hunting witches, and he broke the witch's spell, and they were turned to stone instead. I used that kind of story. So um, really, all the way down from Curse of the Gypsy down to the summoning, it's all about sort of, um, you know, it's the same story, really. It's about kind of the witch finder. And, um, you know, it turned out, turned out real well, you know, like, and, um, you know, I'm really proud of this one. Yeah, definitely a very strong album. Uh, once again, it, it's a very clean sound. Uh, you, you talk a little bit about your inspiration uh, for, for uh, uh, Stone Tilt with Sa- uh, Savage Stones. Um, yeah. But uh, for the rest of the album, how do you, how do you uh, begin uh, to create music like this? Because, uh, like you said, they all do follow a, a certain storyline. Uh you know, do you begin with lyrics? Do you begin with instrumentals? Uh, with, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how I write always. You know, I always write like this. Now, most ba- most metal bands, mm-hmm. they write kind of guitar riffs. They're yeah. a collection of really good guitar riffs. And the singer ends up like singing on top of it. What happens usually though, you end up singing a guitar riff, you know, kind of thing. And you don't have like a creative flowing melody. I mean, it's okay. There's plenty of bands that do it. I mean, Ozzy did it with Sabbath, you know, he kind of sings a guitar riff and it makes it heavy. You know, Sabbath got that hit with everybody kind of like meshing in, you know, with this, uh, 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 with this fantastic riff and stuff. So they sing a riff, but I, but I approach it completely different. Um, I always start with, um, I get an idea for like a chorus line and the chorus line usually dictates what the song's going to be about. So I, I do what classical composers do, you know, used to do anyway. And that's, I make the music fit mm-hmm. the melody line. So it's written. So, I, so it's relevant. I'm, I'm actually taking lyrics and creating music that fits the lyrics. So it helps the storyline. Because I, I imagine every one of our songs is like a mini movie. There's usually a story going on and, you know, beginning and middle and end. And, you know, I, I try and, you know, do what the classical composers do. I actually write music to fit, not the other way around, not just like music and then throw some lyrics on or whatever it is, you know, like I think it's much more musical to do that. And because you've already got, a, got a nice melody to start off with, you know, it's, uh, it leaves, um, you know, you, you've got a logic to it. So the song's going to be logical, you know, like where it's going to lead next and stuff. So, um, once I've, um, kind of, um, uh, hummed a lot of stuff, you know, into, uh, into my phone or I used to have a tank machine, um, in the car. When I think I've got enough bits, you know, like to sort of thread them together, then I kind of uh, demo demo everything up at home, you know, put really rubbish drums down, you know, they're terrible. <laughs> and um, but the thing is, then I play all the guitars and then sing and stuff, and then I give it I give it the guys to go and learn, and then we either go down the rehearsal studio, or you know, I I. I get the guys to program drums a little bit better, send it back to me, and then we take it to the studio, kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's always done exactly the, the same way, really. So uh, I, you know, I, I'm basically write music to, you know, sort of like write for film, isn't it? Really, I guess, because that's what the songs are. You know, those songs are like like mini stories, and you know, so I put the music to it. So most most people don't, doesn't, you know, they don't do that, you know. But I've I've always done that kind of thing. 
Yeah, and bringing in uh, Henry Conklin, who's the the singer, uh, the new vocalist for the band. Uh, how how important was it to bring a, a singer that can uh, you know project the voice like the, in the way he does and be able to tell us a story in you know with such beautiful lyrics? Uh, oh, lyric, uh, really. he's, he's amazing. He's amazing, uh, Harry. I mean, I was first aware of when we did um, a show at Keep It True in Germany. It's a great festival, and. Uh, there was this guy like at our hotel and he needed a lift to the, the festival, you know, like, and I wasn't aware of Harry then. And we just said, Hey, we're going to, you know, we, we're on the, we're on the festival today and uh, we'll, we'll give you a lift down. And then at the end of the night, Joe, um, uh, he was, uh, Harry was in a, a kind of a superstar kind of band thing at the end, you know, like with a lot of the singers, like members of girls school and different people. And uh, it was kind of, um, they did sort of running free, like Iron Maiden and, Harry just stole the show. He was fabulous, you know. Like, I went, oh my god, you know, like I'm gonna have to, uh, you know, that that is my kind of singer, and uh, you know, I'll have to kind of check him out a lot more. So anyway, so when we when our uh, um, our other singer, you know, like um, it, it became too expensive, you know, like keep flying him from America to to England and stuff, you know, like at the end, you know, and after uh, after sort of COVID, and then we had Brexit in England, you know, everything you know gone up at least double you know everything costs so much and the flights went up beyond belief so we're gonna have to get a singer basically from um this european based you know like that, that we you know we can afford the flights and stuff and it makes it kind of uh viable and you know right away i, I was thinking of harry and somebody told me that he lives in greece and in the end this is this is luck as well um ha um harry i ha harry's wife uh, he's he's one of the biggest Cloven Hoof fans ever, you know. Like, and so what I did, I went. To, uh, I'll tell you what, you know, we looks like we're going to be needing a new sing. You know, uh, you don't think Harry will be uh, into it, do you? And she went, he'll do it. You know, like I went, no, go and ask him, go and ask him. And about like five minutes later, there was Harry going, yeah, I'll do it. You know, like she's played your stuff all the time. You know, you know, I love it. And I said, well, we're in Germany. We're playing a, a show in Germany, like in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks and stuff turn up and then go and watch us and if you enjoy it then we'll give it a go you know like and uh you know we hung out with him and he was such a lovely guy and uh he went yeah i definitely want to join the band so um we started uh we got the backing doing all the backing tracks in england so we sent them to to harry and harry put the vocals down in greece and then sent, sent us the tracks back and then all the tracks are sent to Germany to our producer, Patrick Angle. So, you know, it took about three countries, you know, to uh, to get this album together. And, um, you know, we. But I was completely blown away because I knew it would be great because Harry, you know, you, you picked it out, actually. Harry actually acts a song, you know, he gets into the lyrics and he sings with such passion and power. And he's he's got all the, all the high high notes and, and he sings it with such emotion that uh, I was really excited. You know, every every vocal he was sending back, I, I couldn't I couldn't wait to listen to because uh, they were just outstanding. You know, like and he really kind of raised the bar. So a lot of the reason why I think this is our best album is uh, you know this you know the songs are cool. You know you know they're great songs, uh, but it's produced really really well. And it's got our best ever vocals on because Harry absolutely nails every song. So I feel very, very lucky uh, to have such a great singer in the band. Definitely. Uh, as I was listening to the album, I was trying to pick uh, out my what my favorite song out of the album would be. It was it was kind of tricky. Every song has something different that I really enjoyed. And like you said, uh, Harry's vocals are... are they they have such a diversity in his vocals that it, it's difficult to pick what I like the most about it. But uh, I finally came to the conclusion that I think I like uh, "Darkest Before the Dawn." Uh, oh, right, thank you. The, the yeah, I like that one too. You know, like that's uh, that's that one's real fast. You know, like and uh, at the studio, you know, they went to okay, like for the drummer and stuff and. We've got the, the sort of drum click together. Are yeah. you sure you want it that fast? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we definitely want it. We would definitely want it that fast. And um, you know, with that sort of uh, with that sort of song, it's always like a crowd favorite. You know, you, you're definitely going to want to play that live. You know, because of that that uh, and we're kind of well known for the for the gallop 
kind of stuff as well. So he'd had to have one of them got a gallop, you know. Like, I yeah. think a lot of people would be uh, disappointed, you know, if he didn't have like a forgotten heroes kind of gallop in there. So, uh, I, I mean, I try to, I mean, the greatest thing ever is um, you play a gig and we're, we always, doesn't matter, you know, where we are, we always go and see the audience and hang out with them and, you know, post a you know, photographs and sign autographs and everything. But it's brilliant because the the audience, they tell you exactly what they love about the band. So that way you're doing your market research, you know, like I'm just like thinking, well, they really like this kind of song. So I try to in, in, incorporate everything that the, that the fans love about the band into this album. You know, it's got it's got the fast ones, it's got the epic ones, it's it's got a, a really good kind of single one with um, uh, Last Man Standing, mm -hmm. and you know it's got everything that Clive and Hoof do well. So I was just thinking, well, this is really for them, this one, you know, because it's you know everything you've been telling me that you love about the band, I've tried to include all of it in this album. So hopefully, you know, people are going to really love it. You know, so. I'm in LA, and uh, a lot of the metal scene here in LA has that that classic '70s sound. Uh, for you guys, uh, how easy does that sound come to you? Because this this uh, album doesn't just have that '70s sound, but it, it brings a little modernization to that sound. Yeah, we try to. I mean, the, the worst thing ever, you know, it's like I I kind of uh, I hate safe albums. You know, <laughs> like you know when every every you know the, the van's done the same song forever, and it's always the same song. And I've never liked that sort of thing. I mean, although, you know, I try to keep the our bandwidth really wide, but I know the parameters in which the fans will like, you know, after all these years, you know, God, 44 years, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, so, so the thing is, you know, it's like after all this time, um, you know, I know, I know which, you know, what we can't step beyond. And and the problem is, you know, with a lot of bands, you know, like say, say like the guitar player, hey, I like jazz this week. And you try to bring that to the band. It kind of ruins it. You know, like, it, you know, you, you lose your identity. So when I'm thinking of new things to inject into the band, I'll take like a small inflection of it. It's like Last Man Standing, that's, that's in C-sharp tuning. So it's it's kind of deep. So it sounds a little bit more sort of modern, but it needs that heaviness because of the, the you know the lyric. And originally I wrote it because uh, one of the uh, one of the guitar players in the band he was a he's a cage fighter, and he said why can't we uh, you know why can't we have like an anthem for cage fighters? And I remembered that you know he's not in the band now, but um you know I want you know that's how Last Man Standing kind of um, sort of. That was the germ of the idea for that one. So it needed it needed that sort of set of aggressive and powerful. So um, you know that that one's different. And I like to have every song have its own little unique identity as well. You know, it's like they're different stories. So the song can't s sound the same. You know, like it, you need to keep it fresh. So when you buy a Clove and Hoof album, you can listen to one track. But it still doesn't t tell the tale of the album. You know, you know all the other songs are going to, you know, take you somewhere else. And uh, what I used to love about the albums when I was sort of growing up uh, with sort of, um, you know, the, the bands in my day, you know, sort of like with uh, Deep Purple and you know, sort of um, Black Sabbath and stuff. I was also listening to prog bands like Yes and Genesis. And they take you off into another completely different world. So I like doing that with Cloven Hoof. I like to take people into a story and let them use their imagination, like what's happening. Uh, and because they're like little stories. So you go into another universe. Cause I used to do it myself. We used to stick the headphones on and get the vinyl covers and read it. And something like uh, rainbow rising. And I was, I was just taking somewhere else like we stargazing and stuff. So I wanted to do that like with my band. So, uh, you know, hopefully we do, you know, yeah, uh, definitely. I think every single one of these songs has uh, has something unique about it that people can enjoy. Uh, it's not the same same uh, style over and over. It's not the minute long intro vocals, yeah. chorus, 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 chorus. You know, it, there's, there's a mixture of everything in this album. Thank you so much. Uh, that was the idea, anyway. <laughs> yeah. As the uh, as the band evolves, uh, you guys get new fans, and uh, you know, you guys get more opinions. How how do you drown out like uh, the opinions that change the style of the band or change the, the the identity of the band and continue on with what makes this band work yeah that's a that's a that's a great question and i was th i was thinking about it like this, this sort of uh 
this week, you know, that people have been asking me, you know, obviously with the new album coming out, like different questions. And I was thinking, well, you know, the only way, the only way to get it over, over to um, someone that it, it was done from the word go, really, because what I was getting fed up with is an album bring, you know, a band brings out like two or three really great albums. Mm-hmm. And then they completely lose their way and they change and they end up with something else. And that wasn't why you were into that band in the first place. You know, why change when, when it sounds brilliant kind of thing. And, you know, so how do you do that without sounding exactly the same as well? I mean, I, I, what made me think like this, it was like way back, you know, there's a, there's a great metal, there was a great metal band called um, Crimson Glory. Do you remember like Crimson Glory? Yes. Great art, that Debbie albums. Great, I thought. Very sort of sort of Queen's Reiki and stuff. It's brilliant, you know, like. And they they did another. I don't know what which one was. It, it was really good. So the first two, fantastic. And then I then I remember seeing seeing a few years later they were on a, a TV show that was on sort of late. It's a it's a metal kind of TV show back mm-hmm. in England. And I'm watching I'm watching that and the singer was he, his name was Midnight, wasn't it the the singer? And he's doing this interview and. All of a sudden, you know, the flavour of the month was like everybody wants to sound like a cowboy. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, it's like little fashion trends. You know, it's like going like a, just before grunge, everybody wanted to be a cowboy. You know, Wasp was singing about cowboys and stuff. And, you know, Bon Jovi was making all these cowboy things and Guns and Roses. So everybody's a cowboy this week. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, why change your style? And Midnight was on there going like, yeah, well, the next album, you know, it's going to be more sort of modern and, you know, we, you know, uh, basically we're going to make a cowboy album kind of thing. And I'm thinking, you can tell he's not into it. You know, like you, the, he, he, he was sort of very sort of nervous doing the, 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 the show and they were telling him, you know, like to say, you know, he said, like, it, it, we'll be painted with new colours. I'm thinking, why don't you just tell them to, to get lost, you know, stick mm-hmm. to your style. You sound brilliant, you know, like, and. That's what your fans want. So you don't have to be a cowboy this week, you know, like, and it made me dig in even more, you know, like, I don't care what trends you've got to sound like Nirvana this week. You've got to sound whoever I'm going, we're going to stick to our guns because that's the music I love. And, you know, and your fans love it as well. So, you know, why completely change? You know, you you, you can play inflections of other things like uh, when we did, uh, Thousand One Nights of Arabia. I use like uh, sort of a Hungarian minor scale on that, so it kind of sounds like uh, sort of um, sort of Arabian and in in Egyptian. Funny, isn't it? Hungarian minor. It sounds Egyptian as you're gonna get. So, but um, you know, like so you can have inflections. You know, like I'm always for bringing kind of uh, you know mixing it up a little bit, but never change the style. Play the music you love and play from the heart and. And your fans will stick with you, and you know why ruin it? Why ruin a great band by completely changing your style just because of fashion trends? I hate fashion trends, and, uh, and you know it's like, and um, you know it's, it's funny because we stuck to our guns, and it's all come back, hasn't it? You know, new wave of British heavy metal is really loved the whole world over, and I'm so pleased we never, we never, we never changed. You know, we kept we kept our musical integrity. And uh, kind of kept going and, and fighting for true metal, and you know a lot of them bands and stuff. It's all gone now, but but true metal's still there. You know we're we're here, aren't we? <laughs> so so we were right. <laughs> um, you definitely were, and this new album is just as incredible as all the rest of your albums. Uh, it continues with that same magnificent style of. Uh, 70s metal which was oh, so amazing and had such innovation of, for its time so uh congratulations on this new album and i hope the best for it thank you so much my, my friend and you know i'd just like to thank all the fans out there you know for sticking with us all these years um you know it's just an honor to play for them and you know we write for ourselves first and the fans second and we don't write for critics at all we just keep playing that metal and you know God willing, we'll we'll make a few more albums yet. You know, I'm I'm already start. You know, I've just had this. The vinyl came to my door like Sunday, and I went in the studio, and we're starting on the next one. <laughs> so, wow! So it's kind of exciting times, you know. So uh, you know, hopefully, we'll be talking about the next one. <laughs>